Uh, welcome and thank you for joining us for another episode of the Rivulus Irrigation Training Series. I'm your host, Richard Restucia, and uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, factors to consider when selecting ag tech. And I love this subject because it doesn't seem like anywhere I go to shop today, uh, and more so in the technology area, I just feel like I'm overwhelmed with solutions. And when I think about irrigation, ag tech, uh, man, I can choose from satellites, soil moisture sensors, ET, somebody doing it for me, and the list even goes on a few more. And uh, this does feel overwhelming. And I really thought, well, where should I start? And uh, so to help us learn where the best place for us to start is um, Connor Cunningham. He's the technical sales and project manager for uh, Jane, uh, working with Mana now and uh, still working uh, Jane Logic uh, software as well. Uh, Connor's been a big part of the uh, uh, irrigation uh, management consulting services at Jane. Uh, he's done a tremendous job helping growers in the Central Valley uh, increase their yields and uh, decrease their labor costs. He's a graduate of Fresno State. Uh, he's been involved, uh, he's very young, but he's been involved in ag tech since he graduated. And uh, you don't find many people with the experience, uh, both hands-on and uh, knowledge that Connor has. We're really lucky to have him back today for another webinar. Uh, Connor, welcome, thanks for joining us today. Yeah, thank you, thank you. And I, I actually feel honored because this is the second ag tech webinar that we've had post merger so I'm very excited that I was able to get called up to the stage here to be a part of this this is really exciting well anybody who's seen you do a presentation Connor or been a part of your education knows why uh, we have you up here you do just a great job and everybody's in for a treat today um but before we jump into these factors the first question I had you know we were talking a little bit before we started about weather and the season and the wild rains we had uh, all through the winter how is the season going there in the Central Valley? What, what's it like? Yeah, it's been a weird start uh, is probably the best way to say it. Um, I know a lot of folks in the nut industry have been uh, very shaky and very concerned about how everything's looking. I, I've been asked multiple times by multiple growers, seeing as you know, I travel north and south across the state. So I see a lot of orchards, right? I see a lot of different crops and I see a lot of different conditions. And, uh, you know, for the Bakersfield area, kind of the south southern part of the state, you know, they typically have warmer temperatures. So it didn't affect them as much. But as we start to move more northern in the state, we definitely have kind of a slower start and we have significant impacts on the yield. So, uh, you know, a lot of the the real heavy hitters, the non perels in the almond space, um, those have, you know, look like they're going to be a little bit slower this year. Uh, however, some of the other varieties uh, that don't typically do as well as non uh, they're also looking really well. So, you know, you kind of have this, this balance, you know, you know, where in the past, maybe some of these other varieties didn't go as well as the non but now they're kind of shifted a little bit. So it, it's definitely a weird start to the season and people are, you know, just working around trying to figure out all that. And, but, you know, for the pistachio market, it's looking really good. It looks like it's going to be an on year. So, wow. you know, there, there's highs and lows. Yeah. Well, it's great to hear, right? The, the, the high part of it is great to hear. And uh, so uh, irrigation's in full swing then. Oh yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's a, uh, it's been a slower start just because of all the rain that we've had. And uh, it's been, more of a chance for people to get fertilizers on uh, versus doing actual irrigation. But, you know, like we were talking about before the webinar started here, the heat is starting to rise and it's starting to come. And so that is definitely causing us to really actually start putting on some legitimate irrigation now. Yeah. So Connor, um, you know what I'm saying, right? I know a few years ago when I showed a customer some satellite imaging, they said, oh, that's great. That's all I need. I'm good. Just give me that. Right. But there is so much uh, ag tech and irrigation available today. Um, but it does, it can feel a little overwhelming. Uh, do, do, do you understand where I'm coming from when I, where, when I say that? hundred percent. I'm even overwhelmed by it. If I'm being honest, <laughs> there is so, so much out there. There's, there's so many options. There's so many providers, so many different ways of going about 
utilizing the tools that we have to accomplish some, sometimes to accomplish the same goal. You know, sometimes you're, you're looking at a challenge and, you know, one provider saying, Hey, we can come at it from this way. And then, you know, other providers are saying, Hey, we can come at it from this way. So it can be, it can be a little much, uh, yeah. especially if you're, you're not familiar with it. If, if this is your first introduction to starting to look at some of these tools that are available to us today. Yeah. So, um, where do I start? How do I uh, how do I start evaluating what's uh, how do how do I learn what's out there? How do I evaluate what's right for me and and uh, my farm or my ranch? I mean, what how do we put all this together? Yeah, that is a great question, and that is legitimately where some people start. So, you know, let's go ahead and click over to the next slide here, and that will be uh, part of what we're talking about here. There we go. All right, I had to wake it up a little bit. <laughs> But yeah, so that is definitely a question that some people have. I, I talk to a lot of farmers, as you can imagine. And, you know, when I start to have this conversation with people, I'll say, well, hey, you know, what, what are you looking to do? What, where can I be a value to you? And a lot of people will say, well, you know what, my neighbor down the road, he does this, or you know what, I just got some money from NRCS. And so I need to make sure that I'm compliant with that. And so they kind of start off by getting their feet wet with it, ag tech like that, right? And then you have a minority of people who have actually gone to all the industry events. They've done a lot of research. They've heard a lot of sales pitches, and they've also been to a lot of the field days. And so they say, you know what? I know exactly what I want. I know what uh, parts I need, what sensors I need, what automation I need, and here's what I'm going to do. So can you please provide me? with a system that will accomplish that. And so you kind of get this gambit, but for the sake of today's webinar, let's go ahead and go back to what you're talking about. Let's say I'm just starting to get involved with this and you know, it seems like it just feels like I'm drinking from a fire hydrant, right? So where, where do I start? And so as you can see on the slide that I have here, honestly, I feel that the easiest way for us to start to try to drill down to where we're going to go ahead and dive in is to start with your pain points. And what I mean by pain points is think about your day-to-day -day operations on your farm and say, okay, what are some of the challenges that I face day-to-day? -day? You know, maybe, maybe I've got 10 different challenges that, you know, are always causing stumbling blocks for me, but, you know, maybe we can narrow that down to three. Let's say, you know, what are my top three challenges? Try to drill those down, put those into words, and then say, okay, is there an ag tech solution or is there an ag tech offering that can help me with that in one shape or another so that would be in my mind probably the easiest way to get started and so uh if you look at my list here this is not an exhaustive list this is just some of the most common things that people come to me saying hey i would like ag tech to help me solve some of these challenges here and so the top one on the list here is obviously labor because as we know, labor costs and overtime costs ain't getting any cheaper. So hmm. it's been over the past couple of years, it's it's been very, very popular for me to have that conversation with growers where they say, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and jump in with automation first. I want you to turn on my pumps, turn on my valves, control my fertigation, and then we'll start to branch out from there. So that's definitely been the, the trend as of late as a lot of folks are looking to automation uh, to get that to get that benefit from that. Yeah, I love this approach, Connor, because you know, pain points, I've got them. You know, I've got mm -hmm. an extensive list. And so, mm -hmm. but you hit the nail on the head where, uh, you know, we don't always think about this, but you've got to prioritize your pain points. Where can you make right. the biggest gains the most quickly, right? This is going to change right. your year. So, uh, so I love that you prioritize that and yeah. uh, I want to hear about the others, but I did want to remind everybody we've got the Q&A and the chat open. So if you've got a comment or a question, put them in there and I'll get them to Connor where appropriate. And uh, I want to remind everybody we've got some great uh, Irrigation Training Academy t-shirts to uh, give to those who ask good questions. Oh, can I ask myself a question and get one of those t-shirts? <laughs> <laughs> I just get a t-shirt just for showing up today. Sweet. <laughs> You know what they say, if it's for free, it's for me. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, all right. So <laughs> pulling myself back here. So <clears throat> now that we've started to have that process, that thought process in our head of, okay, what are some of the, what are some of the goals? You know, maybe let's not call it challenges. Let's say, what are some of the goals that I'm trying to accomplish, right? Now that I've started to formulate that and manifest that in my mind, 
now I can start to have more of a brass tacks conversation and say, okay, now that I have these goals or these challenges identified, where is a good jumping off point for me? And so what I did was um, I actually recreated a diagram that the CEO uh, of the high tech division, uh, Havav, created. So I, I really liked this diagram. I thought that it painted the picture beautifully. Uh, so I wanted to share it with everybody today. And so if you're at home listening after the fact on the podcast format, I'll explain what we're looking at here. You know, we got a series of half circles and they're all nested one within the next. And what this is trying to represent is that depending on where you decide to dive in at, what level of um, commitment that you're trying to make to working with ag tech, there might already be a foundation layer built into that somewhere else. So let's think about the NRCS example that I talked about in the first slide. So if we say, okay, I've gotten some free money from the government, which who wouldn't want that? And I need to make sure that I'm compliant with that. Well, typically with the NRCS, we're going to want to make sure that we have a soil moisture probe and a pressure sensor showing how we're being very efficient with our irrigation application. So right away, that's going to go ahead and move us up into this, what I would call the second tier right here that I have labeled monitoring. And if you notice within this diagram, within the monitoring circle, we already have the satellite offering built into that already. So you can already see that, hey, I am going to get the benefits of getting access to this funding. I'm going to get the benefits of having access to this real-time data. But built within that too, I'm also going to get the added benefit of having access to the satellite data as well. So now you can start to see how, depending on what you're trying to do, you can really start to pick and choose. You know, when I talk to people, I'll, I'll often equate this to adult Legos. I say, hey, this is like adult Legos. You, you pick and you choose what you like to build what you need. And then that way you're ready to rock and roll. Um, one of the things that we talk about internally is we say the one thing that is consistent in agriculture is that everybody's different. <laughs> everybody's situation is unique. Everybody's different. And so I think it's really important that as people are starting to research and as start, people are starting to think about this, you really want to think about who you're partnering with to be your ag tech provider. You know, you, won't, you don't want to necessarily partner with somebody that says, yeah, I can get you all these all these uh, data sources that you're interested in to help you with some of these efficiencies. But at the same time, I want you to buy this really expensive mating disruption service as well. So, you know, with Rivulus, we're, we're more of like that one-stop shop. We've always been that one-stop shop, whether it's the ag tech or it's the drip hose, you know, you can pick and choose to make sure that you pull together all the tools and the resources necessary to make sure that you're going to accomplish those goals that you set out for yourself. Yeah, excellent. I, I love this slide um, and I want to describe it a little for those that are listening, but I also have a couple of questions that have come in. Um, and so the, the, this first question is from, some, from somebody and they're asking, uh, satellite seems to be the place to start then, right? This is, uh, uh, this is, would be the basic, right? So right. one, I think uh, there's many places to get satellite. Why satellite with us? Right. That's I, I like that. It's, it's a multi-part question. And I, I think that's a really good question because I agree. That's that's why I I created the diagram the way that I did. I wanted to specifically call that out because with satellite, you're getting data. You're getting data from your field specifically. But there's no hardware in the field. You don't have to necessarily be concerned with, well, is is my equipment going to be safe from tractor blight, which no equipment safe from tractor blight. We'll hit on that in a little bit. But it's, it's definitely a great way that it you're not necessarily committed to um, having that hardware in the field and some of the additional costs that come with that. So it's it really is. It's a great introductory place to start. Yeah. And so then somebody else is asking, is it expensive? Oh, no, no, no. That's again, that's also why I put it at the bottom, because that's why I say it's a great starting point, because it's it's very low risk. Also, from an investment standpoint, you know, you're only four dollars an acre for the satellite service. And that's giving you ET information, telling you 
directly how much water is being pulled from your field specifically. And then it's also giving you information on your vigor, your crop's response, letting you know, hey, how is my crop responding when I'm applying my irrigation, when I'm applying my amendments and then making my injections? How is it responding? And then how is it changing over time? That's something that really makes us unique as we showcase how that vigor is changing over time in a really easy to understand format. Yeah, so Connor, am I correct in my thinking? You just said $4 an acre. I think that for a lot of the permanent crops, these growers might have tens of thousands of dollars in the field. Right. And so for $4, I've got a really inexpensive insurance policy if that's all I wanted to look at it as. Right, right, exactly. And kind of going back to the NRCS example. So let's say you did put one of those probe sites out and you know, let's say we have 100 acres, we put a probe site out and it's fairly uniform soil. This does happen here in the Central Valley. We put that in a good spot. We're tracking our soil moisture. We're tracking our pressure. So we're cataloging our irrigation events. But then the satellite will then read the entire rest. So it's not just a single point that's being monitored. You're now coupling that with actually looking at the entirety of the field. It's, it's a really powerful combination. Okay, and you just answered the next question because that was uh, somebody was asking, well, if I have the satellite, do I really need the monitoring? How do they work together? Yeah, so they they do. In my opinion, I I would prefer that if you know if you have the satellite, I would like you to also use a probe because I think that they work hand in hand really well. But you can just start with the satellite and have the satellite just by itself, and you can get a lot of really good information from that. You can tell the difference between the trees. I've I've seen it before. I've seen growers that are irrigating two fields that are neighboring that are different varietals, different ages, irrigating them the same. And the satellite showed a slight difference in the two and it illuminated that they were over irrigating. They were able to change that really quick and bring that vigor back up. And then also, you know, keep from getting anaerobic conditions out in the field and then also not stress out their crop by being overwatered. And then help us out here, Connor, explain what you mean by automation too, right? What does that mean, right? Because I'm going to have the satellite, I've got the monitoring, I know what's right. going on in my field. That we're, how does the automation enter? Right. So, you know, with, with, you know, kind of your, I would say your quote unquote standard, your baseline automation, typically most people are automating pump and maybe a couple of valves out in the field. And so with that, you have access to some monitoring because, right out the gate, we automatically throw some pressure sensors and a flow meter cable on there as well. So you're tracking your water consumption and you're also tracking the efficiency of your system as well, making sure that it's running at peak performance as well. And so that's kind of what I say by going from monitoring to automation, but then the full suite of auto, uh, excuse me, automation and monitoring together would say, okay, let's take that a step further. We're getting all that, all those benefits of having the automation tracking our system's efficiency, but then we're also gonna look at our application efficiency by putting some probes out there, putting a weather station, so on and so forth, whatever that might be, putting a couple of tank sensors so that way we know exactly when it's time to order more chemicals that we're gonna be injecting into our line. So that's where you start to say, okay, where are all these additional points that I can really start to leverage this initial investment that I have into the system? That's really neat. You know, uh, Dr. Hillier from the Wet Center there in Fresno was on last week, and he said for the first time in history, pressurized irrigation is being used more in California than flood. Yeah. And man, yeah. I can see why when you add all this uh, technology to it, you, you would want to be on the cutting edge here. Right, right, exactly. And that kind of segues us into the, the next part, because you know, there are benefits that come from having access to precision tools like this. You know, you, you really do benefit from having that data right there at your fingertips, you know. And so, you know, again, this is just a small smattering of the benefits that I listed here, but this is really not an exhaustive list. This is just some of the most common things that I've seen that people have talked about benefiting from having access to precision tools on their farm. So we've got another question coming in about precision tools on the farm. Right. It's coming from someone and they want to know um, what's better to buy your monitoring equipment or rent your monitoring equipment. So, oh no, I think uh, Connor may have frozen up. <laughs> Let's give him a second to come back and uh, certainly hear me. 
Yeah, you're back. Okay. Okay. All right. Good. Good. Oh, a little hiccup there, but okay. Yeah. So going back to your question, it, it really depends on your financial situation and who you're partnering with. Uh, some people offer only leasing options. Some people only offer purchase options. And then some people offer both. So it just, and then it also, again, it really depends on what your financial situation can handle. And that's why I think it's really important to think about, again, who are you partnering with? Who has that flexibility built into their organization that's going to help you with you and your unique situation and your unique goals? Yeah. So help us out here. Uh, I know there's a ballpark of numbers here, but right. a soil probe, I mean, we're we talking the same price as a tractor. Oh, definitely not. No, no. You're talking a few thousand dollars for a soil moisture probe bundle, and you're talking tens of thousands or more <laughs> for an entire tractor. So yeah. um, again, I'm making the point that, uh, you know, this is uh, pretty uh, inexpensive when you think about the value of what's in your right. field and what else you're spending on. it. Right, right. And, you know, one of the benefits that I have listed here at the bottom is connected to net uh, to a network of irrigation professionals. I think you know, Rivulus, we have an entire network built in, you know, between those of us internally at Rivulus and then those of us with our dealer network, Avid Water. We have a bunch of very talented individuals that have a really extensive knowledge of irrigation and agriculture. So again, I think that's a benefit, you know, should you choose to partner with somebody like Rivulus, that would be a benefit that's very specific to Rivulus saying, hey, if you work with us, some of these other additional issues that you might have that might be outside the reach of ag tech or might be outside the reach of, you know, changing out your valves out in the field, you can bring all that together and, and be able to really uh, gain access to that value right there. Yeah, I'm really glad you mentioned that. And I don't know what it is about irrigation people, water managers, but they end up all being very passionate about what they do. And they're very, I mean, it is a complex science. And uh, people say, you guys really get into it. And uh, certainly the team that you've been working with now for many years uh, mm -hmm. has always pushed themselves to learn more about the industry, learn more about water management, more about the tools available, and then how to apply all that knowledge. Um, right. right. It's really been great to see. And I don't, I, I can't think of another team that has the experience and knowledge that you guys have, uh, especially in the Central Valley. Oh, 100%. I, I think you hit the nail right on the head with that statement. You know, we have so many great individuals, just to name a few, you know, we've got Corey Broad, we've got Damian Jellen, we've got Colin Scholl, we've got Frank Toves, we've got Mike Wanzell. We have a really solid network of people who really understand and, again, are very passionate. I, I think most people here in the agricultural industry as a whole are very passionate about what we do, and we really want to make sure that we're making a difference at the end of the day. Well, and then here's the key to what you just said, I think, and that is I can pick up the phone and call any one of you at any time and you'll answer and you'll talk to me and you'll help me. Right. And uh, I don't mean just me. I mean, the, the, all, the, all the growers. I mean, this is a resource that is just uh, phenomenal and, and available to all of them. Yes, yes, definitely. I, I had somebody call me because they knew I worked with technology and they were having issues with their back flush controller. Not my products, not necessarily my problem, but I wanted to do what I could to help this woman out that was having these issues with this back flush controller. And I sat with her on the phone for over half an hour. You know, it didn't necessarily benefit me. It didn't turn into business for me, but I just, I wanted to make sure that I was there to help her out. And I was able to get her connected to some of the folks at Avid Water to help her out with her issue, because it sounded like it was much more of an extensive issue beyond her, her controller specifically. Yeah, uh, that's a great example. Um, Connor, we have another person asking a question about this irrigate the correct amount. Do you mainly mm -hmm. see people underwatering or overwatering? Uh, it's much easier to overwater because you know you're not going to be in trouble. <laughs> it, it's, it's a safer bet to overwater. And so there are some issues that come with overwatering as well. I mentioned it already. You know, we can have anaerobic environments which can start to kill off the roots and also allows for certain pests and certain diseases to proliferate 
you know, one of the most common and probably the most popular ones I can think about is Phytophthora in mm -hmm. almonds, where it actually starts to eat away at the root system. And that's where you start to see those trees falling in the orchard, right? And that's because it's just, it's too wet. And, uh, you know, sometimes that's just because we have a really wet storm come through, but it also can be because we're irrigating too much too soon as well. So irrigating to the correct amount, I think is much more important. And, you know, the point that I also wanted to drive home here, it, when I was reading the promo that you wrote up for this webinar leading up, I had to chuckle to myself a little bit, you know, because everybody in the past, the, the cliche in the ag tech industry is, oh, I'm going to save you 20, I'm going to save you 30% on your irrigation this year. And it's, well, you know, we're now, we now understand that, yeah, that's not necessarily what we want to do all the time. We want to make sure that we're, we're meeting that demand and that we're also prepping for any further stressors that might be coming down the line with the correct amount of water, right time, right place, right amount, right? Right. So then do you ever experience somebody who's underwatering? Yes, I do experience that. And it's for, you know, a myriad of reasons. Sometimes it's because they don't that their system, their actual irrigation system is underperforming where they thought, well, if I put on 40 hours this week, I should be putting down enough water to get down to the depth that I'm looking to get, or I'm supposed to be putting on an inch by putting on X number of hours, right? But what they don't understand because they didn't have access to this information before was this the data coming from these precision tools starts to illuminate that, hey, you're actually underperforming. And when you thought you were putting on an inch, you're actually only putting on half an inch because your system's overworking to try to overcome some of these inefficiencies that can really be corrected with some very small adjustments. You know, it's, you know, changing out some leaky filters. It's going through and changing some leaks in the fields. It, sometimes it's just really simple um, changes like that can, that can really make a big impact, but sometimes you can't necessarily see it until you have access to that real-time data. Sometimes we, we really start to have those issues uh, brought to light. You know, a quick story, I work with a grower up in Madeira. He's an automation user of ours and, you know, talking about, you know, built-in tiers. Because he had the automation, he, we also put the pressure sensors on the filter station pre and post tank. And so typically he, for the way his system was designed, he was supposed to be seeing anywhere from 30 to 35 PSI across his tanks when he's running. When he started running, he saw that he was only getting 19 PSI, thought it was just a fluke the first time. The second time he started irrigating, saw that he was only getting 19 PSI again. Well, that's when he decided to call me and I looked through the data. I looked through the connection history to make sure that the site wasn't falling offline. Everything looked perfect. I didn't see anything wrong with the data, but I decided to commit to go out there and, and look for myself because he lived far enough away. That's why he had the automation. I went out there while the system was running. The, the data still said 19 PSI. And then the physical gauges on the tanks also said 19 PSI. As I said, oh, okay, we have a larger issue here. As we started to dig and uh, drill down on what the issue was, it turns out that his pump unfortunately started to suck up some sand and he ruined the turbines in the bottom of his well. But we were able to find that early enough on that we negated any additional damages and cost loss because we found that issue right away because we had access to the data showing us the negative trends in that efficiency. Yeah, that's um, right. And then just think what you saved him had he not had that information, you know, and right. crop loss, potential crop loss. Wow. Right, right. Exactly. Exactly. And so, you know, it kind of ties into one of the other points that I wanted to highlight here on this slide was, you know, the loss of 20,000 plus gallons in an entire season. I sat in on some uh, Almond Board of California presentations last year, and Tom Duvall was the one that gave the presentation. So Tom, I don't know if you're on or if you're listening now or in the future, but just want to say you did a great job, full of great information. And what he was saying in that presentation was there's a lot of uh, small things that you can change, but if you don't lead to some really significant losses over an entire season, and this 20,000 gallons was what they observed and recorded were, were leaky filter stations. And it was just because, you know, gaskets had worn out or you got rusty cracked tanks that were, you know, leaking like a sieve. And that accumulates to a loss of 20,000 plus gallons in an entire season. So interesting. And then I'm guessing too, if I'm underwatering, I'm probably not going to get as, uh, I'm not going to get the best yields. 
No, definitely not. <laughs> definitely yeah. not. So, but again, you know, we can start to see, we can start to see these trends by having access to this data in real time. And yeah. so, you know, part of this benefits section here, I wanted to show an example of how we can identify that in the data itself. So I put an example here in the presentation. So you can see I pulled a screenshot from Jane Logic. And what I highlighted here in red is the grower wanted to soak the root zone and build up that water down to 48 inches. So our very first irrigation event, we put on 24 hours to get down to that 48 inch depth. The next two irrigation events, we irrigated 12 hours or less, and we still got down to 48 inches. So really the kind of the moral of the story here is we didn't need to, you know, historically we would have said, well, I know for sure if I want to get down to four feet, I'm going to do 24, 24, 24. But right here we can see that by having access to the data, we could actually cut back on 24 hours of irrigation in three irrigations. So, and I already know what everybody's thinking. Well, Connor, that's kind of hypocritical. You just told me that we shouldn't be under irrigating. That's not what I'm saying here in this example. What I'm saying is we're irrigating the right amount. We already filled that profile up and now we're maintaining a good, healthy profile by meeting what the needs are. You know, I know this field later on in the season, we had to put on more water once the tree started to suck up more from the profile. So we did meet the right amount. Yeah, it's so interesting. Um, and I'm glad you brought that up. And I think uh, we should have you back in the future to just talk about like, how do I know when to turn my water off so that I hit the right amount, right? I can't wait till it's there. Right. Um, so this would be kind of a fascinating whole webinar. Yeah, I would be happy to come back and talk about that and many other topics about actually how to practically apply this data into your day to day. I think that's something that's that there's a hunger for that amongst uh, the customer base here in the Central Valley. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So now that we've, oh my goodness, come on, there we go. All right. So now that we've talked through some of the benefits, we've seen some of the examples. Now I want to talk about some of the pitfalls that we want to avoid when we're working with ag technology because I've made some mistakes. There's no denying that. And my customers have also made some mistakes. So what I'd like to try to do is I'd like to try to talk about some of those today. So that way, hopefully the people watching today won't make those same mistakes or people listening at home won't make these same mistakes. So I, again, made another list here, but this list is not exhaustive. These are just some of the most common pitfalls that I've come across uh, in my past uh, seven years working in the ag tech industry. And, you know, the top two were probably the most common mistakes that we come across, you know, making sure that crews are aware. Um, I don't care who it is. There is no ag tech provider in the world that is resistant to tractor blight. All right. <laughs> so, you know, you really want to make sure that your crews and your guys are and gals are aware that, hey, I have this hardware out in the field. Please pay attention. But it's also you know, it would behoove everybody to put a little bit of forethought into it ahead of time and say, okay, we obviously want to place these devices out in the field where we're going to achieve our goals, whether that's automation or monitoring or the both, but we want to make sure that we put it in a place that drastically reduces that risk of getting hit by a tractor or an implement, a shovel or wildlife, right? Yeah. A great example is, you know, doing valve automation and making sure that you, your wires are protected and then you know, we really recommend putting some sort of chicken wire or even uh, building a small cage uh, around the valve so that way you try to keep the coyotes out because it's usually the coyotes that are going after those wires. So yeah, that's, that's a great idea. idea. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. I can't claim it. You know, it's just things that I've observed. Yeah. No, it's a really good one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then another one is farming infrastructure, which ties to the picture that I put on this slide specifically. Like I said, a lot of people are looking towards automation. And so I'll talk to them and say, yep, I want to do some automation. Come look at my field uh, and tell me what I'm going to need to get that done. So I'll go to the field. I'll look at the pump panel. Boom, everything's ready to rock and roll. And then I move out to the valves and I'll come across this. They say, well, yeah, I'd like you to automate my valves. Well, you, sir, have a manual butterfly valve. Uh, <laughs> unless you have deep pockets and 110 power at this site, we're not going to get that done. So, you know, I have to then have that conversation with the grower to say, yes, 
uh, existing irrigation systems can be retrofitted to have automation. However, we are going to have to make some additional investments to bring some of this, the other aspects of this up to snuff. So we're uh, irrigation automation ready. So, you know, in this instance, you know, we'd have to dig down three feet, expose the pipe, put in a 12 volt solenoid actuated valve. And then that way we're then ready to go to then start receiving those benefits of automation. So, you know, that's just something, you know, just to be aware of that, you know, sometimes there's some hiccups along the way when you're getting started, don't be surprised. It's, it's actually, you know, it is common that there are some growing pains that come with getting started, but, you know, we can work around them. Again, working with somebody like Ribulus, we have years of experience dealing with some of these issues and we know how to negate them and work around them very quickly when they do arise or to even avoid them in the first place, so. And just to clarify, uh, Connor, if I ask you to come out and you discover, gee, um, it's a manual valve, this is going to be hard to automate. This is uh, just part of the service you provide, right? You help uh, survey the situation and, and, and give proper advice based on the equipment they have. Right, definitely. And again, you know, this is why it, it's a benefit because Rivulus, we have our dealer network, we have access to Avid Water, and they do such incredible work. I've done multiple jobs just this last year where I've partnered with Avid Water to come in and help me on projects. This is a picture from a field where we replace this valve, this manual valve with a solenoid actuated valve. So that way the grower could then have access and be able to control the entirety of their system through automation. So it, it's really a benefit that you would work with somebody like us because we have access to all these professionals and we can get this scheduled out in one fluid transaction and make it as easy on you as possible. Yeah, and then I see one of the pitfalls to avoid is uh, pressure accurate across the field. You guys do some testing on the system before, what, what happens here? Yeah, so those uh, growers that want to also come alongside us and start to work with us as part of our water management services. One part of that service is we actually do come out and do a survey. And, and if we deem it's necessary, we will actually do a distribution uniformity test on the field to make sure that we understand exactly where we're starting off at, because sometimes the DU is so low that it, it really wouldn't benefit anybody to put technology. It'd be like putting a Band-Aid over a cut that needs a stitch. You need to stitch that sucker up first, let it start to heal, and then we can come back and keep. So, you know, it, it, you definitely want to make sure that everything is operating so that way you can get the full benefit tools that you've invested in. Yeah, so it's nice to know these tests are available as yes. well as the mm -hmm. help available. Yep, yep. And like I said, we have a, a number of talented individuals within our network that are ready to and eager and happy to help. Yeah. Yeah. So with that, that kind of brings me towards the close here. So just wanted to say thank you for having me uh, put my contact information here on the screen. And, you know, if there's any additional questions here, I'd be happy to, to answer anything right now. Yeah, I really want to encourage people to take advantage of uh, reaching out to Connor, either email or cell phone. He will answer your call. He'll respond to your emails. He's excellent at that. And he really wants to help. So uh, this is one of those uh, few times where you have accessibility to an expert uh, that's going to help you and not charge you. So it's, it's really a nice opportunity. So Connor, as usual, you did a fabulous job uh, giving us this information. I know I feel more comfortable uh, about looking at any uh, ag tech irrigation or any ag tech uh, it's similar process, right, that I would go through uh, for any, any technology I was buying. So thank you. This was wonderful. It laid it out for us very well. Thanks to all of you that are uh, joining us today. I want to remind you that at the changeusa.com forward slash trainings, you can see well over 300 trainings that we have for you there. Uh, we're going to be back here next week. Uh, we're going to be talking to Kevin Stewart about uh, T-tape, Rebulous T-tape. It's uh, going to be a very uh, thought-provoking and interesting presentation. Again, Connor, thank you. And thanks thank to you. all of you who watched. And uh, hopefully we'll see you back here next week. Thank you. Thank you all.